This is an RNZ podcast. You know, if you were going to kill someone, why would you make it obvious that you'd been there in the first place? Um, you know, I don't think you'd head in there and and sort of have conversations with them and and, and deliver scrap. Kia ora, I'm Jesse Mulligan. I'm host of the Daily Afternoons program on RNZ, and this is Crimes NZ, where I talk to people who are connected in one way or another with serious crimes that have happened here in New Zealand. Today, Blair Enzor, investigative journalist, tells me about the murder of scrap metal dealer John Reynolds in 1996. John Reynolds left his home that morning, um, as he would every Sunday morning. He was the only scrap metal dealer in Christchurch known to be open. Um, And he went via a a rubbish dump and collected some scrap. Um, And he took that to his scrap metal yard in Hazeldean Road and you know he had a handful of people that brought in scrap metal to him that day Um, and it's believed that as he was sort of closing up at around midday uh, you know the roller door had been pulled down um, and the you know the smaller door that was within the roller door to his scrap metal yard and that's that's a reasonably important bit of detail that we'll touch on down the track Um, he'd closed the main door but the, the little door wasn't shut uh, and he um, was struck, well, the police believe he was struck from behind with a heavy object repeatedly, um, and he was found uh, about 6 p.m. by his brother lying face down in a pool of blood uh, on the floor of his workshop. And it was his wife who had raised the alarm, though, right? Because he was due around then to head back home for some lunch. Yeah, so about one o'clock, he was um, he was due to head. Well, he was due home by one, and he was he was pretty punctual. Uh, and he and his wife were scheduled to go shopping for a washing machine that afternoon, which I think was quite a, a big ticket item for them. Uh, and his wife uh, had, was looking forward to that pretty keenly. And when he didn't come home, she called the workshop. There was no answer. Um, and then she called his brother, and his brother didn't seem to fussed about things. She went down and checked out the yard and it, it appeared to be locked up. Uh, his car, his, his white Mazda Bongo was missing from out front. Um, and she spoke to his brother and he thought, oh, well, John will just be off, you know, doing some errands. Uh, she was pretty troubled because, it, like I say, he was he was a pretty punctual sort of a guy who was known mm. to be um, and pretty reliable. Uh, and so eventually after she'd hounded John's brother enough, uh, you know, he went down there and, uh, you know, noticed that one of the locks to the the little door and the roller door uh, was missing. And he managed to gain access using, I think, a spare key. And when he got inside, he found the alarm was off. Uh, And as he sort of swept around the the workshop with his torchlight on, he he came upon his brother near the scales. Um, And I guess one of the interesting things, uh, one one of the key things in this case is that you know, for all intents and purposes, I think it's it's pretty well established that this was a case where uh, it was it was kind of a robbery, or was, was you know there was there was a small uh, box or tray that John kept in his office where he'd keep money, uh, and that was missing, and there was like a little smudge of blood on his desk, uh, and but when police were you know looking at his body, they found two thousand two hundred dollars in his top pocket. Uh, so whoever had done this uh, had, had missed that money. That's fascinating, um, isn't it? And quite, um, we'll get to this, but quite visibly in his top pocket, I think one of his customers that day had actually mentioned seeing it there, this roll of cash. Yeah, a guy called Ben Johnson. And Ben Johnson uh, was looked at pretty closely as part of the investigation. Uh, ben Johnson was known as a, uh, he, he was pretty rough. Um, he is known a bit of, as a bit of a hitman on the fringes of gangs. I think his son uh, is a patch member of Black Power in the North Island now. And, uh, yeah, no, he, he had these sort of weird rituals with John where he, John would hand him the money and I think possibly even let him, you know, like he'd touch it and do all sorts of, you know, I think he was pretty obsessed by it. But, uh, you know, 
Ben Johnson was was a person of interest, and police looked really hard at him, searched his house. But I think, it, you know, Martin and I have talked about this quite a bit. If it was Ben Johnson, it would be extremely unusual that the, the money would be left on his person because um, Johnson had seen the money there that day. Uh, and, you know, if you were going to kill someone, why would you make it obvious that you'd been there in the first place? Um, you know, I don't think you'd head in there and, and sort of have conversations with him and, and, and deliver scrap. Uh, but he'd, he'd made life tricky for himself because he'd lied a little bit to police around the uh, whether he'd actually sold scrap metal to Reynolds, but I, I think that was more because he was nervous about saying that the scrap he'd sold to Reynolds was stolen. Yeah. Um, and that probably, you know, talking about stolen scrap metal, John Reynolds, um, you know, he, he lived, he had a home life, which he, he had two lives. One, he lived at home and he worked hard, right? Uh, and he wasn't much of a guy who went, he didn't go socializing at the pub much. Um, and um, I've lost my train of thought there, but he, he, yeah, no, sorry. He, he wasn't, he wasn't, yeah, he, he wasn't, um, a straightforward character, I suppose. Um, other people that they spoke to, uh, someone said that he was a bit crooked. Um, so there was probably a suggestion that he was involved in, in a bit of um, illegal activity or at least marginal activity himself. Yeah, and I think that made the investigation quite challenging for police because when it came to uh, looking through his records, trying to identify who his customers were, there were fake names in the book or... Right, you know, there weren't names written down, and he he was known as a bit of a soft touch by those perhaps uh, who were trading um, in scrap metal to 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 get hold of drugs. Uh-huh. As in, like he and they 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 were trying to get money from him to go and exchange for drugs. And he um, he wouldn't ask too many questions about where the metal came from. Didn't appear to be the case. No. Yeah. Not to suggest in any way that uh, he played any part in or deserved any of what happened that day. And, you know, perhaps if it had been a quieter weekend in Christchurch and around New Zealand, this case might have got more headlines. But there are a few things going on, Blair. Yeah, so that same weekend was the weekend of the Port Arthur massacre. So in terms of, you know, crimes globally, uh, that's one of the bigger ones in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, certainly in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and then that same weekend here in Christchurch, there was a gang shooting involving the Epitaph Riders and I think uh, their rivals, the uh, Road Knights. And then there was an elderly woman also who had been uh, quite badly sexually assaulted. So I think resource was pretty pretty stretched and uh, Reynolds' murder was kind of last cab off the rank. So they were having to bring in investigators from home um, to to investigate it. And it didn't really hit the headlines properly for three, four, five days after the fact. And even then, you know, when it did hit the headlines, it's not one of those cases that's really um, resonated with the public, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, talk, I was talking to Martin about it earlier on, and, and you know, Reynolds is, he, he's, he's, he's a pale, stale male, uh, for want of a better word, you know. Uh, and he, he's not a Kirsty Benton. He's not a young teenager who was, you know, snatched from wherever she was or her, mm. her life was cut, cut really short. He was a rough diamond. Uh, but he was, he, you know, talking to his family now, 20 years on, they're still deeply impacted by what, what happened to him. So how did that investi- investigation go then? Um, you mentioned Ben Johnson as a potential suspect. He'd visited the scrapyard that day, but anyone else on the police list? Oh, well, let's have a, look, have a talk about this vehicle of his. Yeah, so his, he, he obviously drove to work in a white um, Mazda Bongo truck, which was parked out front. Uh, but when uh, when his wife went down there later in the afternoon, it was gone, right? And the, and the workshop appeared to be shut up. And um, so the focus initially in the inquiry was where the hell is this white Mazda Bongo truck? And uh, there are a number of sightings of it going across town with two youths sitting in the front seat of it. These two were youths um, that left a boy's home early that day. They were a guy called Toa Wai Happy and a, another one called Corey Stevenson. And Corey Stevenson was only 11 years old, I think, if my memory is correct. And uh, they um, were looked at very, very closely by police because it turned out that they had taken the vehicle at uh, about the same time that Reynolds was killed. Uh, around about 1.15 they took it. 
uh, and they were captured on CCTV wearing wearing clothes at a nearby business, um, and those clothes were the same clothes in that they were eventually caught in later that night. Uh, and there was no traces of blood on the clothes. There was no traces of blood in the vehicle. And investigators eventually, despite sort of thinking early on, like, well, this is going to be pretty open and shut, um, established that, that, well, they've never categorically ruled them out, but they were comfortable that those two weren't involved. Um, just based on the lack of evidence, um, you know, forensic evidence on their clothing. G- the, given the nature of the scene, they thought yeah. that there would have been blood on that clothing or in the vehicle. Just coincidence, eh, that uh, these two stole his uh, his Mazda Bongo on the same day that he was killed. It maybe suggests too, given that they saw the they walked past and saw the keys in there, that he was sort of part way through leaving when um, whatever happened to him happened to him. Yeah, quite possibly. Yep. And, and look, just very opportunistic. And if you're, you're Corey Stevenson and Tyler White happy, I, I'm sure that uh, you probably look back on that day and think, well, we got dragged over the coals and it was an incredible case of bad luck. Okay. Who else then? Who's on the? Who else is on the suspect list? Well, I, given Reynolds was known as a bit of a soft touch uh, and, you know, people would take uh, their scrap metal in there to, to get money to go and buy drugs. Police had a pretty close look at some of his suppliers, probably the least reputable ones. And look, we, we don't know how they have come to uh, receive information uh, about this individual, but you know, one of the, the persons of interest that has never been eliminated is a guy called Kent Gorry. Uh, now, Kent Gorry is a, a very interesting character he's missing part of an ear i think he's got a glass eye um he's missing one of his testicles if i think if i can say that jesse if i have you know i've gone too far i've gone too far already no, i think that's um it's an important detail uh, uh and he had a bit of a record um you know and he's also sorry he's, he's, he's lost a couple of uh partners over the years as well and one of the most high profile of those partners is mallory manning who people will know as the uh, prostitute who was uh, taken from Manchester Street and killed um, a few years ago. Uh, so he's had a he's had a pretty troubled life, of Kit Gorry. Um, but police have had a very very hard look at him and have never been able to rule him out. And he he was a known supplier of uh, of Reynolds, and was not long out of jail. And he said on the day of the murder that he was at home with his uh, partner Marie Fitzgerald. Uh, but then later changed his story. And uh, when we interviewed him, he confirmed that he had lied to police initially and that he hadn't been at home and had actually gone out to buy some acetic and anhydride acid to uh, manufacture heroin. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, he has always, he's, he's always been there or thereabouts in terms of the investigation. But if he is the one that has done it, police have never had enough evidence to, uh, to charge. Right. He was just uh, a quote, a bad guy who was around at the time and they decided to have a look at whether he might've been responsible by the sounds of things. I think they received well, reading between the lines. I think they've received information that he may have been involved, but they've never been able to. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Ben Johnson is dead now, right? The other suspect. He is. Yep. yep. Well, he—I wouldn't say he's the only other suspect, but he's—he's he's one of, uh, you know, the other suspects who was quite high up the list. Um, but you know, Kent Gorry, his sister Tanya Gorry, we spoke to, and and another guy, Kerry Craw, uh, were all part of the same group. Um, that you know, and they and they were known to be uh, dealing in, in hot scrap. Is Kent still around? Kent is still around. Uh, last time I. Uh, tried to approach him for comment, which was when we were doing this podcast. He was living in an upstairs, boarded up. It was a, It's a hellhole. I don't know how you live in it, but he was living in this upstairs flat with boarded up windows and uh, whatever else, not too far from sort of on the eastern fringe of the city centre. You say um, try to talk to him about it? Well, you know, we, we put some questions to him and he spoke to us initially and he was going to sit down for a one-on-one, but then he pulled pin, so... But his, we spoke to his mother, and his mother was very frank. And you know, she uh, she has, you know, she was pretty nervous when Kent told her he'd lied about the fact uh, his whereabouts that afternoon. But she's she's pretty comfortable; he doesn't have it in him to have done it. So, 
Yeah. Um, do you get nervous, by the way, showing up for an interview like that? Uh, yeah, but that's kind of part of it, I think, isn't it? I mean, I, I kind of quite like turning up to work and not knowing what door I'm going to knock on the next day <laughs> or later that day. Yeah. We should mention your podcast too, which people can listen to. Um, and uh, I guess that gave the, breathed a bit of life into the case. Yeah. So uh, after the podcast uh, ran in 2018, we were contacted by an individual. I've just got to be a bit careful about how I, I frame all this. But he, um, there, there, there was a witness that police never identified. They, they appealed for sightings or, or a woman with blonde hair who was seen nearby the Hazeldean Road scrapyard um, to come forward. She was seen getting out of a white van. Well, the individual that contacted us claimed that he knew that woman and that that woman had come to him looking for an alibi on the day of, or for the day of the murder. Um, and that she had told him that he was, uh, that she was the lookout that day. Oh. Um, and that, you know, and she was known to wear, so she was a, uh, a prostitute on Manchester street and she was known while she was a prostitute to wear a blonde wig or actually numerous wigs, but among them was a blonde wig. But after the murder, those wigs were nowhere to be found. Uh, so, um, I, I think um, it would be fair to say that that woman holds the key. Right. She was seen there. You've got a fairly good, reliable suggestion that um, she had admitted to um, to being at least the on, on the watch, uh, which would suggest that she knew who did it. Am I interpreting all that correctly? Yes. Yes, you are, yeah. And, and does somebody know the name of that woman? Well, I'm aware of the name of that woman, but I can't, for legal reasons, I can't talk about that. Yeah, please don't. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, know, I know who she is. We've approached her for, for comment, and she's declined to comment. Okay. Any other clues at the scene? Surprising that there wasn't more in the sort of forensics um, that might help lead police to a suspect. Yeah, and it's look. I, I haven't had access to the full file, so I don't know exactly what forensics police are sitting on. But you are dealing with quite a dirty scrapyard. Uh, there was obviously a large amount of blood. Uh, they were able to, you know, there was obviously blood in the office. Not a huge amount of it, but a smear, a smear of blood there. Um, police believe that when Reynolds was struck, he fell on his back, and then he was turned over by. The killer as they searched for money. Um, there was a way book nearby suggesting that he might have been, uh, you know, in the process of dealing with whoever it was that, uh, you know, hit him from behind. Like he might have been filling out the book saying, oh, well, this is the receipt for X amount of scrap. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, no, not a huge amount of evidence. And, and, and I guess back in 1995, one of the reasons these cases there are a few of them from around that period and earlier is the lack of uh you know cell phones uh cctv was there was cctv but there wasn't a huge amount of it like if you walk around the central city in christchurch now there's cameras all over the place uh, that are being monitored by a variety of agencies but back then there was none of that and so it was quite difficult to track people's movements in and out of the city and it was quite a quiet sunday as well like very few cars would have been going by that workshop uh, I think that, as I say, I, I think that blonde woman holds the key to this and uh, I think it would be fair to say police are pretty interested well, by the sounds of it and, and what that, uh, that gentleman had to say to us. You've been listening to Crimes NZ with me, Jesse Mulligan. There are more episodes of the series on the RNZ podcast page, or you can get them through your favourite podcatcher, like Apple, Google, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. 